Hi everybody, my name's Dr. Hannah Siddle and uh, I'm from the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Southampton. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. Um, first up, I'd, I'd just like to apologize for the technical issues that we had last week. And so uh, we weren't able to go ahead with the webinar. Um, I really apologize for that. And I'm, I'm so glad that so many of you have been able to make it back with us this week, which is really fantastic. Um, so today we're going to share with you a little bit about some of the amazing research that goes on in our school um, and hopefully to inspire you to um, study biological sciences as well. So we have two really um, amazingly talented researchers who are going to be uh, talking to you guys today. Uh, so that's Dr. Neil Gosling, who's a, a paleobiologist, and he's going to be talking to you about some of his research into the fossil record and dinosaurs and some amazing stuff like that. And um, and also Professor Amrit Muda, who's also our admissions tutor um, and does some incredible research on neuroscience and um, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, before we pass over uh, uh, to Neil and Amrit, um, what I'd like to give you is just a bit of, um, I guess, an overview of the sort of research that we do uh, in the School of Biological Sciences, because um, in our school, our teaching is, and our teaching of our undergraduate um, students is really led by our research. And hopefully you can get a bit of an insight into that today and hopefully answer the question a little bit of why become a biologist? Why is this such um, an amazing area to study? Uh, why it, it can lead you to so many different careers? Um, and, and hopefully um, you get an idea of the sorts of places that this sort of a degree can take you. Um, okay, so. Uh, this just sums up, this slide sums up a little bit about the research in, in a very small way that goes on in the School of Biological Sciences. So um, as I mentioned today, um, uh, Amrit Muda is going to be talking to us about um, neuroscience. So we have a real strength in neuroscience in our school and understanding how the brain works. Um, and I've put in a picture down here as well of uh, some DNA um, because we do a lot of work on research on the genetics underpinning uh, different diseases as well. Um, we also have researchers who are working in different areas of uh, conservation um, and I've actually I always put these little guys up here and I'm not sure if you know what they are but they're called Tasmanian Devils um, and this is the research that my lab uh, does and unfortunately um, Tasmanian Devils have uh, a really horrible disease um, just like humans do at the moment with COVID um, but theirs is actually a contagious cancer and uh, my lab's research is looking at um, how how um, something like a contagious cancer, so this is an infectious cancer, can actually emerge and spread um, and what we can learn about cancers more generally as well. Um, I've also got down here a, a picture of a plant because we have researchers looking at crops and figuring out ways that we can um, increase food production, which is such an important issue in the world today. Um, and finally, I've got a, 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 um, an image here that actually possibly could be the images that you see um, of um, SARS-CoV-2 or commonly known as um, COVID-19 in the media at the moment. Um, and obviously that is a huge issue that's facing the entire planet. And we have some researchers in our school who are working on this as well. Um, so I think you can see here that our world is facing some huge challenges, you know, from climate change to uh, disease, to feeding the world, to conservation. Um, and biological sciences can, um, the research research that we do uh, touches on many of these different themes and can contribute to this. So today I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, a, a couple of these different areas and I'm going to go through pretty quickly because um, it's just to give you a bit of an overview and an idea of what we do. Um, so one of the uh, uh, big areas of research that we do is actually called biofilms and it's to do with antimicrobial resistance of bacteria. So you may or may not know that um, bacteria when they grow um, very often they form these colonies which, um, and this is just a little image um, up the top of the slide sort of illustrating how this works and and these colonies actually protect the bacteria really well and they're one of the reasons that we have problems with antibiotics not working and antimicrobial resistance so we have quite a big research group in our school who are working on ways um, to break down biofilms more effectively and solve this problem 
As I mentioned before, we also have uh, labs working on COVID-19, um, and this is to illustrate particularly one of the research groups in, in our school, which is looking for finding better vaccine targets and improving the vaccine targets um, against uh, coronavirus. Um, this is uh, two of our PhD students who are in the lab working on this. And over on the right here, I'm not sure if you're aware that the um, uh, COVID-19 virus has what we call a spike protein on its surface. Oops, sorry. And that's how it actually infects and engages with our cells and then infects those cells. This is the spike protein. So when they're talking on the news about the different vaccines that are being developed, um, these are actually being developed against this spike protein because it's kind of a weak point of the virus. Uh, but viruses are clever and they use uh, a process called glycosylation, um, which is actually just having a whole lot of sugars around the outside of the spike protein and they use this um, to kind of protect themselves and to um, stop the immune system from being able to see this spike protein effectively. So some of the researchers in our school are figuring out how we can better understand this process of glycosylation or the addition of sugars and how we can use this then um, to be able to make better vaccine targets. So that's some really exciting research that's going on at the moment. Um, we have a lot of researchers looking at climate change and there's collaborations all over uh, the university, but particularly um, in, in geography and environmental sciences uh, to understand about how our climate is warming um, and the impact that this is having on our ecosystems. Um, and that includes, of course, flora and fauna as well. And we also have um, a lot of uh, researchers working on wildlife conservation. We have some fantastic zoologists within our school. Um, and we do research on, on all sorts of different um, animals and conserving these in their native um, wildlife. And just over on the right here, this is a little video of uh, a little Tasmanian devil um, who was in this trap. And we were, one of my PhD students was out in Tasmania trapping these guys um, to have a look at these infectious tumours that they have um, at the moment. And this is one of the ways that we've then captured them. And of course, the devils, once they then get out of the trap, um, are really, really, really happy to see the back of us and they run away pretty much as fast as they can, except for occasionally when they get so scared when they get that out of the trap that they actually just freeze and they just stand there <laughs> for quite a while until the researchers gradually move back and away from them. Um, but they're um, a, a really interesting species and disease to look at as well. Um, and finally, we have some fantastic evolutionary uh, biologists. And you're going to hear from one of those in just a moment, Dr. Neil Gosling. And you can just see him in his very handsome hat there, standing there underneath the statue. Um, and this is actually, he runs a really fascinating master's course um, uh, on evolution. And every year uh, when it's not, a COVID year, obviously, he takes these his students to the Galapagos Islands and they do some fantastic research projects out there. It's an amazing experience and, and, and I'm sure he'll, he'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment with some of his research. Um, and as I said, our, that's just a bit of a, a, a taster of the research that goes on in our school. Um, and we are a research-led university, which means that that kind of underpins all of our teaching. Um, of our undergraduate students. And so this is just to give you an idea of um, what our building looks like. Um, and so this is our, our quite new life sciences building. So that we've only been in for about five or six years, I think. Um, and this is just the, the steps that are going down to uh, our teaching labs that are in the bottom of this, of this building. So this is where all of our practical classes are held, tutorials and so on. Um, when our students are on campus. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is some of our um, uh, undergraduate students who are uh, uh, hard at work in the labs at the moment in these images. And this gives you a little bit of an idea of what our um, teaching lab spaces are like, because um, all of our degrees are um, uh, practical based degrees. And so they do all have a, have a practical component uh, to them. Um, and finally, the, you know, this type of degree, so a bioscience degree, can take you so many different places in your careers. So within our school, we have uh, degrees in uh, biology, uh, zoology, um, biochemistry, biomedical sciences, pharmacology and neuroscience. 
but we find that our um, undergraduate, our graduates go on to all different sorts of areas. So we have some that go into um, either training them to be a doctor and medical sciences or more into clinical science. We have um, uh, graduates that go then into research and analytical sciences. We have some that go into agriculture and environmental sciences and then others in, in maybe careers that you may not have thought too much about like forensics, patent law, um, pharmaceuticals and so on and also of course teaching as well. Um, so this is some of the places that, that, uh, that, that these degrees can take you. So what do you need to do to become uh, a biologist? Well, I'd say the main thing that you need is curiosity about the world around you. Um, but uh, there's also a, a, a really great array of degrees in, in biological sciences. And uh, we'll be really happy to take any questions uh, that you have that you can post in the chat um, of, the, of the webinar today. Um, so if you've got any questions at all, there's no need to wait till the end. Uh, you can just pop those in the chat and uh, we'll be able to get back to you as the webinar um, goes on or we can, we, if there's anything that we don't get to, we can address it at the end of the webinar as well. Um, so please don't be shy with the questions. We're really happy to answer anything that you want to that you want to ask. It could be about the research. It could be about studying. Um, it could be about the type of degrees that are out there um, available for uh, for you to look at. Um, I am aware that your UCAS deadlines have, have been delayed a little bit. So if we can help with answering any of those questions, we're, we're really, really happy to do that. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to my colleague, Dr. Neil Gosling. And I think this image here is a really apt one for Neil because he's going to tell you all about um, some of his research into dinosaurs and the fossil record and evolution. Um, and I think you're going to really, really enjoy it. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, and our team will now uh, switch over to uh, Dr. Gosling. Thanks, Neil. Thank you, Hannah. OK, so hopefully you can see the uh, the title page of my talk. So I'm going to talk to you about the history of life on Earth, and I'm going to take you through a lawfully long period of time in a, in about uh, 20 minutes. OK, so um, Thank you very much for coming to listen to me and I will start now. So I'm, I'm a paleontologist and I am interested in understanding the, the way that life has got to be the way that it is today. And also you can use historical events, you can use um, extinction events, you can use the changing climate throughout the past to help us get an idea of what's going to go on in the future. OK. Just trying to get that to advance. It's decided. There we are. So geological time is a really hard thing to get your head around. The Earth formed 4.56 billion years ago. The first cells formed oh, between three and four billion years ago and insects appeared 500 million years ago. So even the shortest period of time here, um, 500 million years, is a con is it the time is just it's something really difficult for us to fathom. So one of the things that you know, geological time is we human beings appear at this point here, but this this beautiful diagram, and I really like this diagram, doesn't give you an idea really of the scale of life so maybe we can turn it into a into a clock we understand clocks so if we we have a, a face of a clock we get the origin of the solar system um starting here and it moves its way around and humans humans again appear in the very last second of the very last day of the, of the very last minute rather of the last hour and the 24 hour cycle it's it's we can't 
get the time. You know, it just doesn't work. There's too much of it. It's just too much time. OK, so can we explain time in a better way than using a clock? And I think we can because humans are really good at understanding spatial um, distance and uh, getting good perception of these um, ideas rather than simply it is to give us because time is a very abstract concept. And if we can apply it to something uh, to a journey, for example, um, and we can put time points along that journey. Well, that starts to make sense a little bit more. So I like to start my journey um, as an evolutionary biologist and being someone who's read uh, The Origin of Species a number of times, um, which was written in 1859. I think that all good journeys in history uh, of, of life should start at Big Ben because Big Ben bonged for the first time um, in 1859. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a journey from Big Ben all the way through along 125 kilometers all the way down to my desk in Southampton in the present day. So Big Ben represents the formation of the earth. My office where I'm sitting now represents the present day. And we can start to ask questions as we move through here about what events are happening as we're going along our journey. And ultimately we can ask our question, how far from my desk did humans diverge from chimpanzees? Chimpanzees are our closest living relative. So we can start our journey, here we go. And at 3.8 billion years, probably more than actually, probably closer to 4.1 billion years. Um, life is absolutely rock solid, preserved in the fossil record um, in the form of these structures called stromatolites. And uh, Hannah alluded to biofilms, these, these uh, sheets of bacterial film. Well, actually stromatolites, each one of these lines represents a biofilm which then gets covered up with uh, sediment and then another biofilm forms on top and so on and so on and so on. So you have eventually these huge domed mushroom like structures, um, mushroom shaped structures of biofilms building up on top of biofilms on top of biofilms. And these represent our oldest um, fossil record. We have to come all the way along to uh, just uh, north of Basingstoke at 2.1 billion years for photosynthesis to happen. If anyone's from Basingstoke, I'm not casting aspersions or anything anything like that now, but that's where eukaryotic cells form. And we've come already 2.56 billion years before we've even got cells with a nucleus. So nothing particularly, ex well, it's hugely exciting in terms of, of, of the origins of life, but there's no big organisms, there's nothing. This is all single celled organisms which are still um, sitting uh, doing their thing. But uh, we've already come through more than half of the of the age of the Earth. We come down to just north of Winchester. Um, we are now 900 million years ago before we have evidence of sponges, animals. OK. We are now that's within about 20 miles. It's not even that far. It's 15 miles from my desk. OK, about 25 kilometers. So now we're coming along from Winchester. Winchester is about nine or 10 miles, and this is where we end up with bilateral symmetry, the first evidence. And what we know is, is that we have little trackways that can only have been left by something that has a bil bilaterally symmetrical body with its legs moving either side of its body. And this is happening in Winchester. This is about uh, 15 kilometers from my desk. We come south and this is where the Cambrian explosion takes place at 535 million years. And by this point, we've come eight ninths of the entire history of the age of the Earth has happened before we get to Winchester, uh, before we get to the Cambrian explosion. And we are now less than um, nine miles from my desk. We come down now, we're just near the golf course on the M3, uh, Otterbourne Golf Course, it's the next turning. 
we've got land plants at 456 million years. Now we've moved down and we're in at 400, at 416 we have the first fossilized insects. At 397 we have the first evidence of tetrapods, so animals with four legs, and we are now less than 10 kilometers from my desk. So all of the history of life so far has got us, has brought us to within 10 kilometers, okay, of my desk. And this is the first point where we end up with animals with four limbs. We come down to Chandler's Ford. If you come to Southampton, you'll notice that in Chandler's Ford, there was a really huge Asda's. Lots of students go there. And that's where the dinosaurs appear in the fossil record. And 96% of the time since the uh, since of the age of the earth, 90% of 96% of the whole age of the earth has passed by the time we get to the dinosaurs. OK, it's a huge amount of time and evolution has generated these wonderful forms. But these icons of of the fossil record, they only appear within uh, the, the, the last ninth of the age of the earth. We don't get um, birds until we come to the the turning for, um, for, 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 for the M3, almost joining with the M27. We are now within about five kilometers of my desk and then we get flowers as well. And now we're into really recent history. If you were to come to um, Glen Eyre Hall, if you were to stay at one of the halls, it is about uh, it is less than a kilometer and a half from my desk. Glen Eyre Halls is where 66 million years ago the Cretaceous tertiary extinction event happened which wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs and the pterosaurs and all of the other exciting organisms that we are uh, familiar with and 98.5 percent of the time since the earth has formed has passed. We're now at the junction of Burgess Road and uh, Hill Lane. This is the point where monkeys appear. We are now half a kilometer from us, from, from my office. We're now right on the Conkles. 99.87% of the time since Earth has formed has passed. We are on the concourse outside the building. OK, six million years ago, just at this point here, um, this is University Road. My office is here. We are now about 45, 50 meters from my desk and humans diverge from chimps. We come right onto the concourse. There's a lovely flagpole. Um, that's, this is where Ardipithecus, a, very, a fairly human-like skeleton, um, 4.5 million years ago, that's where that diverges from us. Homo erectus is just outside the back door by the coffee shop um, of our building. So in very, very recent history now, anatomically human, uh, 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 Anatomically human skeletons appear five meters from me. Here is. There we go. That's one meter. <laughs> so five meters from me, just along from my office. That is where anatomically human skeletons appear in the fossil record. This far from my desk, from where I'm sitting now, on this scale, 81 centimeters, Neanderthals die out. 27 centimetres is the last ice age. Agriculture is at 24 centimetres. Where's it gone? I've lost my 24. There we are. Biblical creation as described in the Bible, 15 centimetres from my desk. OK. And your birth, I had to go and pinch one of my wife's darning pins. Your birth, or rather, in fact, really a whole human lifespan on this scale is less than the width of this darning needle. So why is this important? Why is getting an idea about geological time so important? And the main reason for this, I think, is because given the enorm enormous amount of time that we have, rare events can happen. One of the arguments against evolution, which is thrown up, is it's, oh, it's just the chances of these things happening. Uh, it's so unlikely. However, when you've got the huge expanse of time that we that we have, OK, the chance of a, of a mutation happening um, that is going to be beneficial 
is going to be is very likely. OK, there is a one in 100 million ch chance of any DNA base pair um, mutating in any given generation. But you've got three billion base pairs, OK, in, in a human genome, which means that 30 base pairs will mutate. So in a population of 250,000 humans, there will be 7.5 million mutations every single generation, which means that humans and chimps that split six million years ago, just about 45 meters from my office. OK, if the generation is uh, 25 years, every single DNA base can have mutated 240 times. And this means that the adaptive landscape, your genetic makeup, can have been well explored. Now, most of those mutations won't be very, won't be useful. They won't be beneficial, but every single one can have mutated 240 times, which means that everything that can have happened and all of these rare events, they can have happened. So, the history of evolutionary theory. I just want to give you a little idea about how we've come up with the ideas that we have. So in the same year that Darwin was born, a Frenchman by the name of Jean Baptiste Le Comte de Lamarck wrote his book uh, Zoological Philosophy. Um, and that was the first idea written down that gave an idea about evolution, and about changing species. Darwin published The Origin of Species in the same year that Big Ben bonged. Um, Gregor Mendel, a monk in the Czech Republic, um, talked about peas and genes and showed that uh, uh, there was uh, the mechanism of inheritance, but unfortunately his work was lost until 1900. But then these, his work was rediscovered. Haldane made observations on the peppered moth in 1920. People were starting to think about genetics and how that could fit in with natural selection. People were doing inbreeding experiments to actually understand how genes interacted with one another. Dobzhansky wrote Genetics and the Origin of Species. We have Systematics and the Origin of Species. And then we pull all of these things together, morphology, botany, cytology, so cell science, genetics, paleontology and fossils, hooray, ecology, systematics. All of these were pulled together to give us the, the fusion, the, the modern synthesis in 1942. And this was the reconciliation, the complete reconciliation of Mendelian genetics with natural selection. So macroevolution on a geological scale, so the changes in species, the, the evolution of dinosaurs, the appearance of birds from dinosaurs, exactly, exactly, and microevolutions in existing populations can be accounted for in exactly the same way. Microevolution is just a little tiny bit which building up gives you macroevolution. So to sum up, you need to have heritable variation, you need to have natural selection, and you need to have a huge amount of geological time, and that is enough to give you evolution by natural selection. And the reason I'm talking about this is because no matter what biological science you study, evolution is the mechanism, the underlying mechanism for all of biological sciences, okay? So no matter what you do, having an understanding of how species form, how genes interact with one another and how they change and how they um, uh, and understanding comparative anatomy and all of these aspects that feed into evolution is fundamental to all biological sciences. And you might ask yourself, well, OK, that's fine. I want to go off and I want to study um, genetics. I want to go and do cancer biology and I complete that's wonderful. But actually, understanding zoology, understanding ecology, understanding biology, the, the sort of the, 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 the less applied versions of biological sciences, is just as important. And one of the things that I run at the moment is a web, uh, a Facebook page, because understanding evolution, understanding zoology, being interested in this, zoology is really important. Because one of the things that, if, if, you've, if anything we've learned at the moment, is that connecting with nature again, understanding the world around us is really important to help us come back together again and uh, get through uh, this time of COVID. So thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope if, I've got, if you've got any questions, I'll be able to answer them in a little while. Thank you.
Okay, so um, I guess that's me. Can you guys hear me all right? Okay, great. Um, I'm Amrit Mudda um, and um, I'm a professor in neurosciences and I'm also um, the admissions tutor. Our idea really for the, um, uh, th this webinar series was to give you an indication of what a degree in biological sciences really means and um, where it can take you in the future. And in this current situation, the pandemic situation that we find ourselves in, um, it's it's very clear that um, scientists make a very big difference. All the scientists around us are um, working very hard to find out ways in which the um, uh, the virus, the COVID virus, works to cause the detrimental effects that it's causing and how vaccinations can help and how other methods can help. This is just one example that's come to light at the, now, but there are many, many, many different ways in which uh, biomedical scientists, neuroscientists, um, biological scientists can make a difference. And we chose two different uh, talks to give you because we wanted to make sure that you appreciated not just where a degree in biological sciences can take you, what you can do with a degree in biological sciences. I talk, I say biological sciences, but really what I mean by that is a degree within biological sciences. We've got a, a number of different programs in biological sciences, as you've heard already from Hannah Siddle. But I also wanted to emphasize to you how the teaching in Southampton is very much research led. We are a Russell Group University, which means that you are taught by individuals who are actively engaged in carrying out research in their area of research. Um, I'm a neuroscientist. My area of research is diseases of the brain, such as Alzheimer's disease, and much of the lectures that uh, many of the lectures that I give um, relate to neurosciences. Uh, and in fact, in the third year, I give lectures in the second part of the uh, the year semester two lectures, which will be starting in a couple of weeks, where the module that I coordinate is all about diseases of the brain. And uh, in that module, I will talk about Alzheimer's disease, but I will be giving students information that's very current, that's very relevant. I don't need to go and read up about it. I'm telling them what's um, the latest uh, in this area of research. And that's what you get if you come to a Russell Group University. In fact, I don't know whether other Russell Group universities operate in the same way, but in Southampton, every member of staff who is working on an aspect of um, research then uh, teaches on that on modules so that the students get the most current information. OK, so I'm going to take you through a very quick whirlwind tour of the research that I do, and it gives you an example of the type of thing that a scientist can do. And this is what I would teach in the final year. And if students came to work in my lab, um, at the moment I've got four students working in my lab, they would work on an aspect of this project, uh, of a project such as this one. So I work on fruit flies, but before I kind of, you know, before you start sort of thinking, what can fruit flies tell you about Alzheimer's disease? How is it relevant? Let me first just, uh, remind everybody what Alzheimer's disease is. Alzheimer's disease is a, a condition in which there's a lot of cell death in the brain. So you can see in the middle panel on the top, you see the brain of an individual who had Alzheimer's disease before they died. You see a lot of shrunken um, gaping holes inside uh, on the surface of their brain, which is effectively telling you a lot of cell death has occurred. For comparison, this here at the bottom is the brain of an individual who died at an equivalent age, um, but this a very nice plump looking brain with no evidence of cell death. I bet you the person on the bottom uh, who had the brain on the bottom really had no a bit problem with their day to day functions with their memory, whether, whereas the person on the top had uh, a lot of learning and memory difficulties. If you look inside the um, brain of someone who has Alzheimer's disease, as was done by Professor Alois Alzheimer, who first described this disease in the early 1900s, and he described it because he looked at this very patient here on the right hand side. Augusta is the name of the patient. She had 
a very profound memory loss and she was a housewife but her memory loss was so significant that she couldn't carry on with the day-to-day -day running of her house and when it became very serious so we're not just talking about forgetfulness we're talking about actually being unable to do anything um, that makes you um, unsafe amongst other people so in today's uh, and to give you an example in today's day uh, in, in today's times, someone who has Alzheimer's disease perhaps would park their car in a car park, would then go to the supermarket or wherever else they go. They would never find their car when they come back because the memory loss they have is so severe that it interferes with them then being able to conduct day to day activities. So for them, they would not be able to find their car to drive home. They'd have to be driven home by someone else. Normal forgetfulness is just not knowing where your car is and then after a little while you kind of find it. People like me drive bright orange cars so that I can spot it uh, in the car park. But um, that kind of gives you an indication of what I mean when I say memory loss that severely impacts your ability to carry on uh, with day to day activities. But coming back to, to the brain, uh, um, Auguste was looked after by Professor Alois Alzheimer. When she died, he looked inside her brain and he described for the first time two structures that I've uh, got pictures of here. One called a plaque, which is on the top, one called a tangle, which is at the bottom. It doesn't matter the details of what these structures are. It's just to tell you that this is not just age old forgetfulness. This is the appearance of some abnormal structures in the brains of people who then suffer from this disease. And there are many questions that a scientist would ask if somebody knew that in the brain of someone like Augusti, you had these plaques there and these tangles, what would the scientist ask? What would the questions the scientist would ask? First of all, the scientist would want to know what is this abnormal structure made of? That'd be the first question. These abnormal tangles that we see at the bottom. So this here is the outline of a nerve cell and that dark structure there, that flame shaped structure is a rope like structure that grows inside those nerve cells. It squeezes the life out of them. Those are made up of a protein called tau because that's what a scientist would first ask. What makes up this tangle? The scientist would also ask what makes up this plaque? If you were sitting right in front of me and I was giving you this lecture in my lessons in Southampton or if you'd even come to a physical um, visit day, I would pause and I would ask you if you were the scientist, what would be the next question you would ask? But because I can't do that, I'll just have to ask you. I'll have to just tell you what I think the next question would be. And the questions that my students in my lab ask are, OK, we know then that this normal protein called A beta, this normal protein called tau that's found in all our brains, somehow they become abnormal to form the tangles and the plaques. How and why do they become abnormal to form the plaques? How and why do they kill the nerve cells within which they form? And how does that then make somebody lose their memory? Another question my students would ask is, if these are normal proteins that are forming inside the, the, these nerve cells, they are normal, but they are found in the nerve cells in all our brains. When they become abnormal, how do they make those nerve cells sick? How do they kill those nerve cells? And how does that lead to memory loss? And these are the kinds of questions that a scientist can ask. And in order to answer these questions, one needs to recreate this process of the tangle formation or the plaque formation and study the sequence of events from when the when they formed to what happens uh, to give you the memory loss. And of course, you can't do those studies in people. So you employ um, model organisms and I have chosen to do this work in fruit flies. Fruit flies are those humble flies that just hover around your fruit, fruit basket, particularly your bananas when you've forgotten to eat them. They are they have been the my the geneticist, the biomedical scientist's friend for decades. Many people have won Nobel Prizes for the sorts of work they've done with fruit, fruit flies. I want, I don't have time to tell you about those studies, but what I can tell you is they are very useful within which to recreate these pathologies to, to effectively. The work I'm going to tell you is I recreated in my lab with my students, we recreated these abnormal tau structures inside the brains of fruit flies to study how they make nerve cells sick. And we were able to do that because we know that many of the proteins that are found inside human brains, in, in humans, have um, 
homologs. We call them homologs, but what we mean by that is there are equivalent proteins in um, flies. So a lot of what you study in the fly will be relevant to people because the protein in the fly that does a particular job, its equivalent protein will be doing the same sort of job in the uh, in, in, in people. So if you can make this tar protein up normal in the fly brain and see what it does, it's very likely that it's doing the same sort of thing in people. The fact that flies are very cheap to do experiments is a great help. If I did, if I wanted to do the same experiment in a mouse, it would cost me a hundred times more. Um, the short lifespan of the fly means that a disease like Alzheimer's disease, which occurs over the lifespan of an individual, somebody I'd have to study a human for 70 years to study the disease. I, if I did this experiment in a monkey, I'd have to study the monkey for 15 to 30 years. If I did the experiment in a rodent, I'd need to study the rodent for two years. In a fly, I can get that answer within two months. So it's a lot, um, uh, it's a lot quicker. And of course, I have some very elegant tools. I can um, create some very nice fluorescent uh, markers of cell death of uh, neural function. And this is an example here <clears throat> that I'm going to give you. But first of all, what was I asking? I was asking, how does an abnormal tau protein, this is the protein, this protein tau, it's what forms these rope-like structures in nerve cells. My question with my students was, how does that make nerve cells sick? When it becomes abnormal, how does it make nerve cells sick? But to answer that question, I needed to first understand what does tau normally do in nerve cells? And so uh, for that, very quickly, you look at a nerve. A nerve has a cell body, which is its housekeeping hub. It's where a lot of its activities take place. It's got a connecting process called uh, an axon. An axon is really a highway where material that's made in the cell body is transported. And the synapse is its business end. So many of you that are doing A-level biology will know the synapse is where neurotransmitters are released. It's the point at which the connections are made memories are really consolidated and generated even at the business end here. So if you look in the axon, tau is found there normally. In this axon, there are many tracks that allow cargo, which contains vital materials like neurotransmitters. They're made in the cell body and they get transported down these tracks um, to the synapse. Tau proteins are normally found on these tracks. These tracks are very stable, are unstable. They break down all the time. They need to be held in place with connections, really connectors, cellotape type um, proteins, and tau is one such protein. Again, if you were sitting right in front of me, and if you were in my lecture, if you come to the university and you come to the third year, you must you know, raise your hand and tell me, Dr. Mudda, I listened to your lecture and you, you, you were meant to ask me this question. I will answer it now. The question I would ask my students is, if the tau is abnormal now, like it is in Alzheimer's disease, what do you predict will happen? OK, so the first thing is you'd predict that that ability to hold this track together actually should become affected because normally this protein holds the track together. If it's abnormal like it is in Alzheimer's disease and it's now not worried about holding the track together, but it's going away clumping to itself and forming rope like structures, what happens to these tracks and then what happens to transport? So what we did was we created a ve some very nice transgenic flies. This is an example of the uh, elegant tools we have. And our transgenic flies effectively had a fluorescent protein, a green fluorescent protein in the cargo, the vesicles that go up and down this highway. So this highway here, and you have the cargo that goes up and down on the tracks. We put a green fluorescent protein in there because we can with the flies. And you could see that in control animals, there's lots and lots of cargo all the way up and down. We did this in animals that we anesthetized and we looked in real time through their nerves. Again, something you can do with the flies. And we were able to visualize this movement of cargo up and down the tracks. It was beautiful, like you're eavesdropping onto a city at work. But when we now express the abnormal tau, exactly as we predicted, these this transport of cargo became very severely disrupted because the the tau should be in there. It should really be keeping those tracks together. We don't know what it's doing because it's abnormal. And see, you see these traffic jams now. The cargo really isn't getting to the end. This nerve is still alive, but the cargo isn't getting to the end. Why does this cargo not get to the end? Why does the presence of the abnormal tau stop the cargo getting to the end? 
And again, if you were sitting in front of me, I'd ask you to predict my students would do that. So normally this is what you think would happen. But if when if the tower becomes abnormal, we think that it just falls off those tracks and those tracks need the tower to keep it stable. And so when the tower falls off the tracks, the tracks just fall apart. And here are real experimental data that we published. There were students on this paper who contributed to this work who who were then authors on this paper. So if you look at the tracks, if, if, I, if, if this track was effectively running out of the screen because the nerve was coming out of the screen, if you slice it in the middle, you see these cylindrical structures in normal animals that tell you the tracks are intact. If you then look through the cross section of a nerve where the tau is abnormal, you don't really see these cylindrical structures. The tau's really fallen apart exactly, or the, rather the the tracks have fallen apart exactly as we would predict. So this hypothesis, this is exactly what the scientist does. You predict, you hypothesize uh, a mechanism by which uh, the nerve cell is getting sick, and then you predict that this may be how and why the nerve circuits in the brains of people who have Alzheimer's disease, who have these abnormal tau structures, is probably now starting to become uh, that's how the nerve cell is starting to become sick. Again, if you were sitting in my uh, in front of me, I would ask you, OK, it's well and all well and good knowing this is how the nerve cell is getting sick. How can you use that for therapy? How can you now say, I know if I look at an Alzheimer's patient inside their brains, transport isn't occurring because that tau isn't binding to the microtubules, they're falling apart. How can I use that information now to devise a therapy? Again, that's what the scientist does. So my students and I, we predicted that if you now use drugs that sellotape the tracks together, there are such drugs. Chemotherapy, for example, is one is, is a, a, a mode of the mode of action of chemotherapy drugs is they 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 sellotape together microtubules, which in the case of cancer cells is a very good thing for cancer cells because it makes them very stiff, the microtubules very stiff and stops them from dividing. In this case, we wanted to stiffen broken down microtubules. So we fed these flies a drug, paclitaxel was the name of the drug, that effectively put those microtubules together and we predicted that the tracks would get sealed together, stapled together, sellotape together, and axonal transport would resume. And indeed, this again is an image from real um, experiments that we did. This was a subsequent paper we published. Ten years later, it takes this long to do. What I've told you in 10 minutes took us 10 years to do. Led to two very good papers. But again, you see here the tracks are broken down in the animals that had abnormal tau. But look, this is the sibling of this animal, right? born off the same parents, but where this one wasn't given the drug, this one was given the drug. Within 24 hours of getting the drug, look, there are so many small microtubules. And this is a very good example of how knowing what, what the biomedical scientist does, understanding disease, this is different to what a clinician does, a physician. I started my career thinking I wanted to become a doctor. I started medical school. I left after a month because I realized that I didn't want to diagnose illness. I wanted to work out how the illness appears so that I could work out how to stop it. This is exactly what I'm doing. I'm working out how the illness appears so I can work out how to stop it. The drugs that we used went into clinical trial um, and they had beneficial effects on Alzheimer's patients. And I want to stop there. I, I apologize if I've taken longer than I should, but I really wanted to give you a very quick world one tour of what being a biomedical scientist is about, what you'd expect if you come to Southampton and I talk by people who are engaged in actual research and how you can contribute to this if you manage to do a project with them. So I'm now going to um, stop sharing my screen and I'm going to uh, hand over to Hannah so that she can tell us, um, yeah, so we can continue to ask, answer your questions, but please do ask questions. Yes, that's right. As Emirates said, please, if you've got any other questions, please do continue put, to put them in the in the chat. We've got um, another 10 minutes to make sure that we've answered everything. Um, and as I said, it can be research related. It can be to do with Neil's talk. It can be do, to do with Amrit's talk um, or it can be to do with our degrees, any of those things. And we're all here now. So that's nice. Um, so, yeah, we're really happy to answer anything. Um, Amrit, there was just two that came up while you were talking. 
Uh, one was someone asking about studying neuroscience and um, understanding addiction. Does that help us with understanding addiction? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I saw your response then, I was about to type, but it's possibly better for me better to, to say it out aloud. So addiction, neurodegenerative disease, these are all disorders of the brain. It's where the brain, the nerve circuits, the circuits in the brain have started to become dysfunctional. Whether that then leads to addiction, it just means that the circuits that are becoming dysfunctional there are those that are involved in reward. And addiction is where they're activated too much and then you become addicted to getting that reward. So it is a neuroscience. Uh, we have a neuroscience module in the final year where you can study that. So in the final year, two examples of the neuroscience modules are one is the neuropharmacology of CNS disorders where you would study addiction, you'd study schizophrenia, you'd study depression. Um, and the other module is the one that I run, which is about neurodegenerative diseases such as uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease where there's degeneration in the brain. So you absolutely can learn about it in this degree, but then you can afterwards go and work. If the question there was, can it enable us to go and work with people who have addictions? Well, I put a link uh, in the chat for clinical training um, uh, programs. They require you to do a first degree in biological sciences and you can work there with uh, neurologists who that could be the clinical training program you go on to um, to do that if you were interested in that. And of course, you could do a PhD or a master's in a, a lab that studies addictions. So that was one question. Hannah, what was the other one? Yeah, um, there was another question. I think Neil actually has answered it really well, but um, it might actually be worth sharing this with everyone. It was just about um, students, are the students that you were referring to, AMRA undergraduates. Um, so I think Neil, you, you, if you want to share that answer. Yes, so uh, absolutely. Um, we involve students in uh, in our research at all kinds of different levels. So personally, I have students who've done their third year projects or their undergraduate master's projects with me. Um, I've also had students who've just come along and said, uh, Neil, dinosaurs are cool. Can I work on them? And as soon as people say what you'll realise is actually that as we become um, middle-aged and start to feel irrelevant um, it's really nice to have young excited people come and massage our egos by saying that what we're doing is important and interesting and if you come along and see us and say I'd like to do something you know I'd like to work with you I'd like I'd just like to get involved in your research then absolutely um, come and you know it, there, there's there's the formal way through research projects in your degree but actually there's students who are getting involved in our day to day stuff as well. And it's not always the most exciting. Aspects of the research, but it's the real research and it's absolutely vital. And I'm writing up projects and papers at the moment who are. Um, who are undergraduates and they're, they're going to have their name on papers. So it is it's phenomenal and it's how I got involved with starting to do research and it's how most of us it's showing that interest, showing that excitement and coming along and just wanting to get involved and we'll never turn you away. We'll always find you something and it's right. uh, a lot of our a lot of our undergraduates as well um, do summer projects with us as well. Yeah. Um, and and or just kind of come and volunteer in the labs and some of the summer projects we can um, find internships and scholarships for them. Not always, but sometimes we can. Um, so there's always opportunities to get involved in in the research in the lab. Yeah, like Neil said. Um, and actually, there was another question there as well that I I think we've answered, but it was asking about um how many of our master students go on to do PhDs at Southampton. And um, I did a rough we did a rough estimate of five to ten. Yeah. Um, a, a year and that's not just in biological sciences though so some of our students go and do a PhD in medicine or in ocean earth sciences and then of course they might go and do PhDs at other universities as well. Yes. So. Yeah I, I think the numbers possibly a little bit uh, lo larger than that Hannah only because it's very competitive to get a PhD placement and so sometimes students don't necessarily go and do a PhD the first year after they graduate. I This year I've been writing lots of references for students who did a master's program with me a year ago, right? They graduated, they then decided to think about which PhD they wanted to apply for and it's been, it, you know, they eventually started two years later. So they don't, for instance, come into our accounting, but um, I think I think about 10% is a reasonable 
estimate for those that go on to do um, PhDs. But they certainly, I mean, ma a, a master's qualification and a PhD, and, and this sort of relates to a question I have there about what careers can you go into. These are no longer things that mean you are stuck to working in a lab. I love the idea of being stuck to working in a lab, but not everybody does, right? But what it means is we understand that the scientist of today, the neuroscientist, the paleontologist, the biochemist, the scientist of today doesn't necessarily need to apply their knowledge in the lab or in the field. They are very much applying their knowledge when they go and work for a pharmaceutical company, where they go and work for outreach, where they go and work for some of my PhD students have gone on to become the outreach officers of Alzheimer's Research UK, where they needed to have a PhD in Alzheimer's disease to understand the disease so that when they go out and raise, you know, engage in events to raise funds or when they need to tell funders what the money has led to, what research it's led to, they can actually uh, make sure that they're factually correct because they understand the research that's been done and they can make sure that they can convey it in a, in a language that is easy for the funders to understand as well. And these are all additional skills you pick up in biological sciences. Over the three, four years you're with us, you will learn how to articulate your thoughts. You will learn how to speak to an audience so that they understand what you're trying to tell them, that you're exciting them, you're motivating them. And those skills actually then put you in a good stead wherever you decide to apply your scientific knowledge. You'll all be scientists, okay? A scientist is not just like me, Neil and Hannah. You're all scientists when you graduate. You'll just be applying your scientific knowledge in a different area and we'll help you get there. We absolutely will help you get there. Um, someone else has just asked if there's any chemistry or pharmacy webinars. I'm afraid this one we've just organised off the back of biological sciences, but um, if you have a look on the University of Southampton webpage and have a look at the, the School of Chemistry, um, there'll be some contact details of people that you can you can um, contact about chemistry. And for pharmacology, um, we do offer a BSc in pharmacology through our um, through biological sciences as well. Um, someone else has asked you, how long does it take for Southampton to respond to a UCAS application? Yes, I can tell you that. Um, and then after that, Hannah, if you can answer Selena's question about a typical first year, I can answer the question about a typical biological sciences turnaround period. So we consider every application, we read all the personal statements and you can imagine, you, you should get a response from us within the within 20 working days because we have a lot of applications and it takes us that sort of time to, you know, make sure we've read all the personal statements and we, we, we kind of agree that you're the right person for us. And if you're not the right person for us from your statement, we will interview you. If you are concerned, I will put my email address at the end of this or it was actually at the end. I, I can put it, I can ask the uh, producer of the show to put my email address as an announcement. Um, please email me. If you've put in your application and you haven't heard from us within 20 working days and you're concerned, email me and I will chase it up personally. Okay, hand over to you for Selena's question. Uh, yeah, so Selena's asking what would a typical biological sciences first year look like? Um, so actually our first year courses, no matter what degree program you're doing, all look very similar, though there is some differences between them, um, but there's some elements that, that are quite similar. So everybody does some physiology, and that's human and animal physiology, both. Um, we do some cell biology and some genetics. We do a little bit of biochemistry, a little bit of plant sciences. And so the idea of our first year is to get everybody kind of to the same level so that when you're going into second year and first year, third year you're ready to specialize de depending on what degree program um, that you that you've chosen and that first year although th there the there's not any formal um, research projects like there is in your third year but there is an important practical element so nearly all of the um, the modules that you'll take in your first year have practicals in them OK, so you'll be in the labs, you're in the labs every week doing your practical. So you're getting those practical skills so that when you do your research project in your third year, you've got those skills that you can call on. Um, 
so you do get some research in your first year, but um, more in your third year. In saying that, there's nothing stopping you from contacting individual um, academics and lecturers. Yep, yep. Um, you know, if you've had a lecture and you really enjoyed, um, they might have told you a bit about, about their research and you really enjoyed it, then you can contact them um, and, and see if they've got anything in the lab that you could get involved in. Um, okay, so oh, Amrit's just put her uh, email address in the chat, which is fantastic. There was one other question here um, as well. Um, oh, I think maybe oh, we captured everything. Um, oh, what are the prime qualities that you look for in your applicants has just come in as well. Okay, so that's a, a very good question. We look not just for your um, knowledge and interest in the subject, right? Because obviously there's something that you read or you, you know, modules you covered in school that got you to think about studying biochemistry or biomedical sciences or zoology. So we obviously look for those things too, because we need to uh, appreciate that you understand what you're going to undertake. But at the same time, we also look for evidence of extracurricular things you've done so that we can see that you're a rounded person. You are going to cope with a degree in at university. You've got an analytical brain. You've, you can work independently. You're not 